This many is sorry, and we're here with another episode of My Truth Podcast. And today, my special guest is a man that achieved everything that young boys want to achieve when they start out in football, and that's to become a professional footballer. Um, my guest achieved that, achieved, uh, achieved some really good stuff as a professional footballer, and then also went on a bit of a roller coaster with his journey. And we're here today to walk through that journey. So I'd like to welcome Tony Kelly to the show. Thanks for having me, Ronnie. Good to be here, mate. Good stuff. So, Tony, um, I'd like to start right at the beginning. So, if you give our audience a bit of an insight to to where you grew up, uh, what your home life was like, and, and then we'll yeah. progress it on. Grew up in Coventry, the Midlands, so those that don't know Coventry, you've heard the term sent to Coventry. Well, I was, I was born in Coventry. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, a big family, five brothers, six brothers. Uh, I always say five and six is one who's not, no longer with us. So, yeah, six brothers, one sister. Um, and basically, <clears throat> from eight, nine years old, growing up in Coventry, all I wanted to do was be a professional footballer. So, back then, it's, you know, obviously times have changed now. So, I was like playing football till nine, ten o'clock at night with yeah. 10, 11 years old, coming in, muddy boots, all the rest of it. Yeah, so mum and dad had a lot of cleaning to do. But yeah, that's how it was, just football mad. So, straight from school uh, to secondary school, joining the school team. So, 11 to 16 was secondary school football, playing for the county. Okay. Uh, Coventry County and then yeah and then moving on from there but yeah growing up in Coventry um, it wasn't easy because we are talking about the 80s now mm -hmm. you know um, it wasn't easy in terms of lots of other issues particularly I'd say particularly racism um, you know there's a skinhead culture all that stuff okay there's a few things to deal with um, but you know we had a big strong family and for me yeah all my focus was on was just somehow I've got to make it to be a professional footballer yeah. that's, that's, what, that's what my desire was so was the drive, you, you mentioned it wasn't easy growing mm. up in Coventry, so was part of the drive to become a professional footballer to potentially help your family get away from the area or, or, or do better? Was that yeah, part of it? Yeah, I think that was that. Yeah, not, not, not necessarily a particular area, but just as, um, as a family, you know, just, just to progress. Um, I had a I've got a twin brother, okay. so it helps that we were sort of like competitive against each other. Okay. So we're both striving to be footballers from nine, ten years old, um, and I think that also with a, with an older brother who was, you know, obviously a really good player and went on to be a pro as well. So you know, we had that drive coming from him as well. As well, yeah. Uh, so the, it, we had a sort of like a, a football family, really. Yeah. Uh, that we, we were all, you know, just striving for footballers. Just on that point, so mm -hmm. you had an older brother that made it pro. You made it pro yourself. You've mm -hmm. mentioned you had a twin, which I'll come to in a second. Mm -hmm. Mum and dad were they? sport people were they sporty athletic where you know where did that come in the genes they sometimes say it's in the genes yeah, yeah. was it was it in the genes like that for the strange thing is mum and dad weren't sporty at all okay. um but they especially with my dad really really supportive okay um i think kids growing up today you know for instance if you're 13 14 15 you've got to go train etc mm -hmm. you do need family support whether it's a mum or dad to take to train and drive you there and everywhere so that's really important i think my dad he took us all over the place came to all our matches school matches everything so the support you yeah. know, that we had yeah. you know, was, was brilliant. You know, so that, that helped that in terms of we could, we could always go to any club in the city knowing that you know, dad's going to take us all the time. Of course. So just, just quickly on the twin, and this is mm. just something that's always in my, my head because I, I don't know many twins. So yeah. is it like what it is in the movies and the TVs? Are you, are you finishing off each other's sentences? Do you, do you know what he's thinking all the time? Yeah. Like, what, what is it like being a twin? To this day, we... If I was if I was here now, like I could I could just go and pick up the phone, yeah, and it would ring, and it'll be him, and that happens probably three or four times a day. So we're in sync with each other every day. Um, so they say some twins go different directions, you know. Mm. Not not all twins. We obviously from the same egg. We're identical twins. Yeah. Um, and some go in different directions and don't necessarily have the same characteristics, but we are exactly the same. Okay. If you walk through that door now, then you guys would be going, what the fuck? What's going on? Yeah, you would. You would because we, we are identical twins, okay. 20 minutes apart. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's like having a best friend. That's the best way I could describe it. Okay. It's like we chat about everything. And I mean literally everything. Everything. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Um, on a daily basis, mm. up to this day. Um, and obviously, obviously, it's been now my journey, which we'll talk about later. But yeah, so he's been um, a solid ally for me. <clears throat> mm. And in terms of you know games you used to play, you know yeah, there, there's there is there is stories in the book yeah, of course. about about you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so actually identical twins. Yeah, yeah. So is there is there any mark? How would you tell you apart then? 
The only yeah, thing, anyway. yeah, the only thing is that he was born with a, a little, like a little boil on his on his head. Okay. So he was in hospital for six months from birth. Okay. So mum and dad obviously told us that they didn't think he was going to make it. Uh, so they'd done a skin graft. And uh, so now, you know, obviously we've both shaved heads now, but, but he's got scarring. So okay. scarred for life. Yeah. And okay. even mum and dad talk about it now that if it was happened today, you know, you see the hospital, et cetera. But this is way back. Mm. Uh, but that's the only that's the only way you can tell the difference. But you'd have to look closer have to, to the scar. Be looking for yeah. that scar. Yeah, but apart from that, um, no, yeah, we are exactly the same, same height. Yeah, he's probably, yeah, he's probably a little bit of awareness about it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we come to football, and when I was talked to my previous guests, you know, they've either got scouted out of, mm. you know, grassroots football or yeah. something. Your first entry point into professional game mm. was through your older brother. Yeah. Actually, he's managed to arrange a trial. Do you want to talk to us a little bit through that experience? Yeah, so Errington Kelly is uh, 61 now. Um and he was playing for AP Leamington and Ledbury Town in the Midlands. And then he got picked up by um, Terry Cooper and signed for Bristol Rovers. Okay, well. um, so obviously there's a, a six-year difference. I don't, I don't know if it's five. But yeah, <laughs> there's a six-year difference. And so he, yeah, we looked up to him. Um, and then he managed to get us a trial at Bristol City. Uh, that they're neighbours. Okay. And so we went straight from school. So today, you know, scholarship, same thing, apprenticeship. Yeah. It was um, a two-year apprenticeship. Okay. For me and my twin brother. And yeah, so that, that was the start of the journey for us in terms of professional football, um, signing for Bristol City at 16, leaving school. Yeah, and that obviously took a, a lot of getting used to because, yeah. you know, you've got to think about it from, because I've got a nephew as well that, that went down the same road, but uh, got homesick at 15 when he was at Coventry. And I'm just digressing a bit, but it's for some young people, when they get released from a club, they can go one way or the other. Of course, unfortunately for my, for my nephew, he went the other way. Okay. For us, you know, we... Went to Bristol City. It was hard leaving Coventry, leaving your friends behind. You're yeah. going to a completely different city. You're living in lodgings. Yeah, so you have to, yeah, you have to, I suppose you have to be mentally strong and you have to sort of grow up quick. So that, that's, that's how it was. So that was the equivalent. They called it apprentices back then. But yeah, that's the equivalent of a scholarship. Today. So you yeah. were living in digs with a family. Yeah, with a family. Rose, I forgot her husband's name, but Rose, she was a lovely landlady. Okay. Um, so obviously fed well and all that. Yeah. But with that comes the other side of it, comes the discipline side of it. And, and that's the bit where I struggled. Um, Talk to us about that. Yeah, what what so, do you mean? Elaborate. Yeah, so signing for Bristol City, obviously, it's all it's all new. You get to Ashton Gay, you see the big stadium, and this you're thinking of it the big time. This is it. But um, I had nat- a lot of natural talent, so I, was, I progressed really quickly. Okay, so much so that I played for Bristol City's first team at 16 in 244 days, which is a record. We stood for 20 years. Um, so everyone, family, back home in Coventry, you know, they're just thinking, oh, God, you know, Tony's going to go bigger Bristol City. Yeah, of course. But it didn't quite pan out like that because, and it's a simple reason, it's because of my attitude. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it was nothing, absolutely nothing to do with my talent. Yeah. Um, I, um, so if, as an example, you've got senior pros, what we call them, 22, 23, 24, whatever, going out clubbing it. And, you know, I, I just... happened to start going out clubbing it at 17 and coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning and with lodgings... They are connected to the football club, of course. Yeah, so they... Re- You'd have they, to go a few. Yeah, yeah, weekly report, you know, how your behaviour is, etc. So, the, obviously, my report, you know, bringing girls back at 3 o'clock in the morning and going out clubbing it and all that stuff. I think yeah. made it. But like, it's basically being big time, Charlie, isn't it, really? Yeah. Let's be honest. So, so where did that come from? Yeah. Because you said that there was a desperate desire yeah. to be a professional footballer when you was younger. Yeah. You know, mum and dad gave you all this great support. Yeah. You've actually now got into a professional football club. Yeah. You've achieved an apprenticeship mm. where all of a sudden there's this, I've made it and Billy yeah. Big Mates come yeah. into it. Like, where did that, wh- why does that come in? I, I, I can't really answer it to the exact reason why, whether it's part of my character, uh, whether it was the fact that, you know, for instance, playing, I remember home game at Bristol, uh, uh, Bristol at Ashton Gate yeah. against Wimbledon. And then we, um, I remember in the players' lounge and then coming out, even coming out uh, into the car park and all that and signing autographs and all that and some girls coming up and all that. In, I think I didn't handle that side of it, the adulation that you get, you know, the attention you get, all that kind of stuff. I, I didn't quite handle that side of it. And was there anyone at the club to potentially mentor you on that? Because you've just mentioned here, and I'd like to highlight again, mm. you were one of the youngest players to ever play for Bristol City's first team. Mm. And you were only 16, 16, 16 when you did. Day, yeah. So was there no one at the club that thought, you know what, here's a young kid, he's still a boy, basically. Mm. We, we, we fast tracked him into the man's world. Yeah. Surely he needs a mentor. Surely he needs somebody right by him to guide him through. 
Yeah, and then that's that's a surprising thing, really. When I when I when I look back now, and I think that because obviously Terry Cooper and the coaching staff, they they know what I'm doing. They're getting the reports of coming in three o'clock in the morning, all that stuff. Yeah, they know what I'm like in training, slacking off a little bit. But not once did you know whether it's um, uh, Jimmy Middlemass or Terry Cooper or any senior pro. Mm -hmm. No one really called me aside. Terry didn't call me to the office and say, you know, Tony, you got an opportunity. It's not fucking about whatever. Yeah. You know that never happened. Okay, it was like get on with it you know what i mean and then when it came to a year later you know that that um dreaded chat in the office the came inevitable it happened yeah so, yeah so, so we fast track a year down the line mm. where you're now going to get a pro contract or get released yeah what happens to tony kelly so terry called me in terry cooper he's an ex leads in england and he called me in and just said that yeah and that's the thing i remember clearly is mm -hmm. that he says that this has got nothing to do with your ability he said you've got all the ability to go as far as you want to go yeah, but your attitude stinks. I mean, that's basically telling me straight. Yeah, uh, you said that you may make it further down the line, but we can't take that risk. Uh, we're going to have to release you. And then, I know the other apprentices were all surprised and shocked. You know, mm -hmm. friends back home were shocked. Um, Who was with you in that meeting? Just is it just, just me? You? Just me? Yeah, just, just me and my one own. Meeting. Yeah, one to one. Yeah, and yeah. then I then I had to go and tell mum and dad that you know I'm coming back home basically. Back home. Yeah. So and what, it, and that, what was that, that like? That was a shame. I think that was a bit shameful. Yeah, because you can imagine I'm going back to Coventry, all my mates, and they were just thinking, well, what the hell happened? You exactly. know what I mean? And I have to try and explain what happened and all that stuff. I don't even think I probably told them the real truth, but yeah. Um, Where was you? What space was you in there? Because as you said, your nephew mm. getting released went another way. What, where yeah. was you? What, what kind of mental space was you in? That I, I was, I was, I was crushed. You know, I was crushed at the time. You know, what I mean, it took a bit of um, you know, a few weeks to really get round to the idea that you know now I'm out of professional football. Um, my older brother, as I said, was his Bristol Rovers. He spoke to me, gave me a bit of advice. And yeah. I think uh, I think he helped us write a few letters for trials. Okay. He wrote, wrote some trials. And then I just um, went to in Eatonborough uh, to start, to just continue my development, really. This is non-league now. Yeah, non-league now. Neatonborough Football Club. Um, Graham Carr was the manager. Um, and it, it was a question of then, at that point then, it's a question of, right, you know, I've got to knuckle down. I've got to change my attitude, et cetera. Um, and I think, I think, the, that burning desire to, you know, you've had one opportunity that's mm. been messed up. And as I said before, you can go one way or the other. And for me, you know, whether it was family support, whether it was my brother, whether it, whatever it was, yeah. I, I decided that, you know, I'm going to try and make a go of this. I've got the talent. I know I'm good enough. Sooner or later, someone's going to spot me. And, you know, when I went to the need to borough, that was difficult because you're playing in what we call the national league now. Exactly. So that was difficult. 17, trying to get a regular spot. Yeah. Uh, played a few games, couldn't get a regular spot. Because um, in the apprenticeship, you're playing your own age group, as it were. Yeah. Now you're, under 17s, under 18s. Yeah. Now you're launched into non-league football, exactly. playing against fully grown men. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that was difficult. Yeah, I think the physical side of it was difficult as well. Um, and then it's just a question of, right, okay. okay I went to, after the Um I went to another non uh, Midlands club, Stratford Town. Okay. Uh, scored a lot of goals at Stratford Town. But then, then things changed. Not on the football side, but things changed in terms of my life because I was then moving to London. Okay. So I'm now going to leave Coventry, and it's a question of when I get to London, I've got to, you know find a club. Uh, so that what, what that changed. What I mean, what that what, changed. My sister, travel. yeah, my sister uh, moved to London to be a teacher. Okay. In college, and uh, you know, she said, "Look, if you you know if you really want to get a Coventry, and, and I did want to get a Coventry because my twin, uh, I should have mentioned earlier, my twin got released um, three or four months before me. Okay. At Bristol City, so he came back to Coventry. And then he moved to London with my sister. Okay. So them two were in London, and after three or four months, they said, "Look, you know, nothing's happening in Coventry. You know, job-wise, it's really, really hard to get a job." Yeah. So they said, "Look, just just come to just London. Come stay in a flat in Dulwich." Okay. So I went to Dulwich, and fortunately, literally across the road, two minutes was Dulwich Hamlet Football Hamlet. Club. So okay. it's like it's meant to be. It's on my doorstep. Okay. And uh, went down to Dulwich Hamlet. I think, uh, yeah, we just asked to come training. Um, and they did have, you know, really, really, you know, a strong side in terms of players. And I've mentioned Name before. some of the so players Andy, that were Andy Gray was captain. He used to play for Palace and um, Villa. Okay. And then we had um, Alan Pardew. So we Alan had, Pardew was yeah, part of the Dulwich Pardew, Hamlet. Yeah, that was our first team. Alan Pardew, Andy Gray, a couple of other ex-Palace players. Okay. So, obviously, I was 17 going on 18. Um, and I broke into the first team. wasn't a regular, regular, but I broke into the first team and played them guys and doing quite well. Yeah. Um, and then it was a mass. It's just a matter of you just you just hope that something happens. But you know, it still didn't happen for another three years. But so I went from 
uh, north from east south east london mm-hmm. Dulwich Hamlet moved to Enfield because the sister moved again, bought a house in Enfield. Okay. Tybury Road, just down the road. Um, and it was a question of them, right, okay, find a club round here. Went to Chesant Football Club. Mm-hmm. Done really well at Chesant. Um, so I'm now 19 now. And then I moved to Enfield Town for only for a few months before the move to St. Albans. And so I'm 20 years old now, St. Albans City, playing the Ryman League, scoring goals. And then it's that's when things started to sort. Silly. Yeah, people started to talk and you know scouts and managers talk etc so your name gets about if you're doing well yeah uh yeah so i could sort of feel like something may happen so already your your sort of um your mental space has been challenged a lot of times you've mm. been released mm-hmm. you've then been thrown into senior football mm-hmm. you're then trying to impress managers in senior football to say yes i know i'm only 17 18 but i can play yeah but you know you're having to bide your time so you've had to do like a two-year journey of biding your time trying to prove yourself you're now at St. Albans, mm-hmm. playing, starting regularly, yeah. making a bit of a name for yourself. The door to professional football begins to open again. Talk us yeah. about that. So, yeah, I could feel that something might happen, but it, it's a strange thing is it, was, uh, it wasn't English football that I was going to go into. It was Swedish football. Okay. So I, there was a scout that came down. Um, and then I just got I got a phone call from the chairman just saying, look, you know, we, we've got someone from Sweden here, Swedish second division, Yemen SCK. Yeah. He said, you, you know, do you fancy going to Sweden? And uh, I was with the missus at the time and we talked about it. They offered, you know, I remember free flat and then we had the free Volvo and the free flights for her to come over and all that sort of stuff. So the deal was really good. The money was tax free. Okay. So it was, and it was only going to be for a season. So the two clubs talked. Yeah. And they said, okay, you know, we'll let him go for one season, but it's only a one year agreement because we want to sell him to an English club. Okay. This is what St. Albans was saying. saying. Yeah. Okay. So I went to Sweden and it was amazing, mate. Okay. It was absolutely. Yeah. Not, not just the football, but the place, the country, uh, the people. Yeah. That, the language wasn't too bad in terms of picking up, you know, speaking Swedish. So okay. I, I sort of learned that language quite quick. It wasn't difficult. Okay. Um, and then the football had done really well in the, in the second division. Uh, and the, the manager of my team was saying that, you know, he could maybe, you know, renegotiate with my club because we you, we think that you can go to the Allsvenska, Al- 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 what we call the Allsvenska, which is the Swedish Malmo and Gothenburg, etc. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I want. That's what I had in my head um, because I did score a lot of goals at Jimenez. Um, but when it came to the end of the season and I talked to um, my manager, I said, look, you know, is there any way that, you know, we can get, I could stay, you know, maybe get to one of the bigger clubs. But it, but it just couldn't happen because there was a written agreement. Uh, so I had to return back to um, St. Albans. St. Albans. But, okay. but, but it was a great experience. Great experience. I was training every day, you know, getting fit. Of course. Yeah, really getting fit every day. And I think that's probably the most um, productive thing in terms of, you know, fitness training every day. Yeah. So that made me a better player. Um, and then basically, yeah, by the time I come back, I was probably twice the player I was when I went. When you left, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And St. Albans at that stage is a semi-professional club, so they're yeah. not training every day necessarily. No, Tuesday, Thursday night. Tuesday, Thursday night, play on the weekend. Yeah. So you've obviously come back fitter, stronger. Yeah. Must have made a huge impact when you came back. Yeah, it did. And I think, you know, the word the word got around that I've come back from Sweden, etc. So now there was clubs, you know, calling up St. Albans, you know, we can run for a trial, etc. And I think the first trial was Southampton. Okay. So Chris Nickel, manager of Southampton. I went to Southampton for a, a week's trial. Okay. Um, again, big names there. Alan Shearer, Matt Littizier, all that lot. So you've turned up at Southampton. <laughs> yeah. This is the calibre of player yeah. that you're going to train And I'm with. 20, yeah. Okay. Um, and I remember, I remember the training session. I remember the first training session. Just the thing that stuck, stuck out is that just the way they ping the ball about. You know, it's like okay. 100 mile an hour, ping, straight to your feet, the touch and all that, all that, all the technical stuff. I had pace, I had skill, yeah. but I still had to build on the technical side. But, you know, watching that, yeah, it was sort of an like eye-opener. Yeah. Um, and I think my, my pace was the one, the thing that caught the eye of Chris Nickel. Okay. We played Oxford United in the, I think it was Central League or whatever league it was called, reserves. Yeah. Uh, done really well. Uh, won a sprint in training. And then, yeah, so we called, it come to the end of the week. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, uh, you know, I know I've done well. I've done well. Yeah, I know, you know, you, you know if you've done well. You know what I mean? And I knew I've done well. Yeah. So I thought, right, okay, what's going to happen here? Um, and we sat down, you know, just like you are now sitting there and he's in his big leather chair, mm. big Chris Nickel. <laughs> and, I, and I'm thinking, right, okay, a little bit nervous. And um, he said, right, China, this is a situation, look, you know, we want to sign you. Yeah. You know, we want to sign you, but 
you know, your club are, are saying playing silly buggers. And I said, what do you mean? Well, your club, he's talking about St. Albans. Yeah, and I goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, they're asking for 100 grand, which back in 1990 yeah. was a lot of money, for a, especially for a non-league unproven player. Um, so he said, you know, we can't pay 100 grand for someone that's unproven from non-league football, so we can't do it. But St. Albans thinking is that they're Southampton, they're in the first division, they're a big club. They, they should uh, have the money. Yeah, they can have the money, it's not a problem. Yeah. So, you know, he said, you're going to have to go and talk to your chairman and see what you can do. He said, I've, I've spoken to um, your manager, Jimmy Noban, and said, look, you know, so it's this question of we'll see what you can do. Yeah. So when I went back. So, so mm -hmm. just to stop you there. So the onus has been put on you. Yeah. Like, I'm just fast tracking yeah. to today where every player has an agent and mm, the, exactly. the agent is the go, go between, exactly. between clubs. Back in, back in, back in 1990. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Southampton have told you if you can go and speak to St. Albans and sort something out, exactly. maybe there's a deal to be done here. And that's the thing that we'll talk about an agent that my agent came about seven years later. We'll talk about it later. But mm -hmm. yeah, at that time I didn't have an agent, uh, coming fresh out of non-league football. Um, so, I so went, what's your feeling here? I, 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 I was, I was angry because I, I, I went back to St. Albans, went back to the board, I went back to the chairman and manager yeah. and I explained to him what's happened about the meeting. They all, obviously already had spoken to Southampton and I said, oh, you know, you've got to let me go, you know, but they would, they wouldn't budge. So it turned out that I fell out with the club. Okay. It turned out that I went on a two week strike. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I just fucking didn't turn up training, didn't turn up yeah, space when I'm striking. So you've had a conversation with them yeah. and they're saying the hundred grand's the hundred grand. Yeah, yeah. They've got to pay it. Exactly, yeah. So we, we couldn't agree on anything. So uh, after about two weeks, uh, they called me back for a meeting. Yeah. Uh, the board did and said, look, you know, the next club that comes in, you know, whatever the fee is, we're going to let you go. And I think, you know, obviously I was doing well for St. Albans. They didn't want me to be out of the team for weeks and weeks. Yeah. So they, they you know, how was Probably it bad. living? I'm, I'm assuming you're with your missus at this time. Yeah, or yeah. You're living with your sister. What was your living arrangement? Was you with your sister? Or was you? No, I was living with the missus. Then. The missus. So, yeah. how was you to be around for those two weeks? Because surely you're angry, you're frustrated. Yeah. A big opportunity here. This club's prevented me. Yeah. What was you like to live with in those two weeks? I, I thought. Well, well, I was angry. Yeah, I was really upset. I was. Diff I was difficult. Yeah. Um, and you got to remember one thing which obviously we're, we're going to touch on, but at this time, I'm 20, yeah. I've already started the gambling. Okay. I started at 18, so I'm now living with the missus, going through this shit with Southampton, and then obviously gambling on a bad day, losing their pockets. So, you know, mentally, you know, I was, I was very difficult to, to, to live with mm. at that time. So I'm not, I'm not only have I got the football issues going on, but I'm starting to develop this problem gambling. Okay. So, yeah, it was difficult. Um, but she was fairly, she was supportive, to be fair. She was supportive. Um, she was just saying that, you know, you just got to keep the faith and that something's going to happen. You know, if Southampton are coming for you, there's going to be others. Other clubs. You know what I mean? And I think, I, I, when I think about it, I think I was fairly confident that, you know, because there was, you know, there was a lot of talk going on, okay. different rumours and this, that, the other. Because Watford were next. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Watford, but yeah, I only went for Watford in a day and I got injured. Okay. So that scuppered that, 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 yeah, that trial. So I got injured at Watford. Um, and there, there was, was another the, big club round the, the corner. And the, yeah, the next that one was the happen. big one was round the corner. And, I, and what happened is we were playing, I was playing against Stevenage Borough. Exactly. Obviously, they're our professional team, but they're in the uh, Ryman League then. We're playing Stevenage Borough Tuesday night and um, we won 3 1. And we had this guy called Lance Pedler up front with me and he scored a hat trick. Okay. So, and I, I remember the manager saying that Stoke are going to be up here tonight. And I just remember thinking after the game, fucking hell, they're going to take Lance, not me. You know what yeah. I mean? So I'm thinking, that's, I didn't expect anything. anything. I played okay. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, didn't you know, pull up any trees. I played okay. Um, but obviously, scouts, managers, they see different things, things things you won't even think about, you know what I mean, on, on a football pitch. Um, so, yeah, they've saw, saw things that, you know, they've said, look, you know, we want to take this player. So I remember the next day, I got a phone call from Graham Padden, who's the assistant manager. Okay. Um, and he said, look, you know, we watched game last night, etc. Alan, Alan wants to take you, um, but we want you to come on a trial for a week. And I was, like you just mentioned, my mental state then, what was an interesting trial. I've already had that experience with Southampton. Yes. I, I, I actually want to sign somebody. Of course. Uh, so I actually turned him down on the phone for the, and I think he was a bit shocked. And in fact, I'm turning him down. I'm not actually going to go for a trial. I explained yeah. why. So. So what was your demands? You said you turned him down. What was you saying? I, I said, I said, I remember the word. I, I said to him, you know, I'm not going to go on another trial. I said, I'd rather come down and talk about a contract. And that's, that's all I said to him. I was rather come down and talk about a contract. And he just said, leave with me. I'll speak to the gaffer and then we'll come back to you. And I, I, it was the same day. I can't remember how long, but it was the same day yeah. that they called me back. 
um, and said, so Alan said, come down and we'll talk about um, two. And about Alan, we're talking about Alan Hall. Hall. Yeah. Ex um, England 66. Yeah. yeah. And um, he said, yeah, we'll talk about a two and a half year contract. You know, tell your missus, um, get the train. Yeah, I remember getting the train. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, yeah, the next day. And I remember ringing my missus, she was at travel agents working. And telling that you know it's happened, you know what I mean? I've got to go to Stoke tomorrow. Stoke tomorrow. Yeah. So I remember you when we had a conversation before. Again, yeah. there's no agent at the moment, but you mentioned the St Albans chairman. Yeah. Perhaps giving you a few pointers about yeah things to look out for in the contract. John and um, John Mitchell, who used to play for Fulham, uh, played in that team with George Best and that. He was director at St Albans. So I remember saying to him that you know I'm going to go to Stoke and talk about contract. You know, just give me some advice and everything. So he gave me a sort of. A, I can't remember what the figures were, but he gave me an idea of what like salary in the second division, that kind of thing. Okay. And I remember one thing he did say, he said that make sure you ask for a sign on me. I don't know what fucking sign on do. Okay. Okay. Right, fair enough. Um, and I went, remember going to Ashton Gate, uh, sorry, Ashton Gate, Victoria Good. Ground. Yeah. Um, the next day, I told him he's got the train down there and uh, turned up, Alan Ball met me, uh, walking around the corridors, going onto the pitch, you know, yes, really excited, mm -hmm. just thinking, this is it. Man. This is it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we went in the boardroom. Uh, he had a contract. Yeah, he had a contract. And um, the strange thing is, which, which going back to what John Mitchell said, is that I didn't have to ask for a sign on fee. Okay. So, you know, he showed me the contract and he said, I think it was 15,000 sign on fee, um, which to me was a lot of money then days. Um, so, yeah, it was two and a half years. Then he, then he showed me all the other things on the contract. So, yeah. Young people now looking at players, you know, Premier League players and all that. It's not just the wage, you know. There's lots of things, yeah. you know, clauses, image and yeah, where you are on the table, exactly. all these different things. So I was looking at this a month. We do well. I'll get that amount. You know what I mean? So it's strong power mm. plays in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, so I was really, really excited and happy. So of course, um, I said, yeah, I accepted the contract. I signed for two and a half years. I told the family and everything. And then, yeah, it was a matter of I think it went back. Yeah, uh, come back up by by Wednesday or whatever. Uh, he said I'll be um, staying in the hotel and that was the other thing so he put me in a hotel for six months yeah. which again was you know completely new but you know great and bringing the food and all that stuff so well taken care of well taken care of you know I mean? so and that was it again just for, for our audience purposes you've achieved it you're now a professional footballer yeah you've had the ups you've had the downs you've yeah. gone to Sweden you've come back you've signed a professional contract yeah just walk us through your first day at training, or your first day as a pro, were, you, were, the, were the other pros welcoming to you? Because here's a lad that's come from St. Albans. Yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of these guys have probably been in the system for ages. Yeah. What was the response to, to you coming into their changing room? I think by then, uh, 21, just just before you exit, January 1990, that's not the So the next month will be my 27th birthday. So by then, I've been around non league football for four years, I've been around dressing rooms for four years. And you will know yourself, different dress rooms, different characters, of course. You know, some boisterous, some quiet, some take the piss, all that stuff. Exactly. So when I walked into, I remember going to the first first day of training, but yeah. the, the thing that stood out for me was everything was all laid out. Okay. So all your kit all folded, all that, that yeah, stuff laid out. Course. Everything's, yeah. everything's done for you. Um, but what, what sort of, I suppose, it took me time to get used to was, was all the banter that's going on and all that and, and I'm sort of, I'm a, bit, I'm a little bit in awe of these players yeah you know you've got players you know Noel Blake and some other big players that you know were at Stoke at the time Mark Steen lots of others yeah and so I'm a little bit in awe of them yeah like you said I've come from non-league football you know I don't know what they're thinking etc exactly uh, so I think you have to sort of you know, gain a little bit of respect. respect yeah. And that can only come by my play yeah, performance. Yeah, performance. Yeah. Um, so training. So walk us through that training. Train, what yeah. Was the, what was the difference between training at Stoke yeah. and training at St Albans, for example? What, yeah. what what sort of things did you get into where that where you've been asked to do that yeah. potentially you weren't asked to do? Yeah. I think uh, I think the, the technical side of training <laughs> took me a little bit of getting used to because okay. you'd be doing different drills. Yeah. You'd be doing different drills where you know, I'll probably stand in the wrong place or something and say, Tony, get the fuck out of there. All these things I can yeah. remember because it's a little bit technical in terms of the, all the different kind of drills I'll Of do. course. Yeah. So I've got to get used to that. Yeah. The fitness side, the fitness was really difficult because it's like we had morning session and then you come back in the afternoon for a little bit in the gym, the weight session, and then we can do cross country and laps. We used to call it a 12 minute run around the Victoria around the yeah. pitch. So the fitness side took me took me a while to get to keep with that. Yeah. yeah. 
But the more the training, the fitter I got. Um, yeah. But the thing, the surprising thing about, you know, the training, the surprising thing about my first week at Stoke was that uh, Alan Ball called me and they said that, oh, you know, you've done well this week, we're going to start on Saturday. And I'm thinking, right, okay, I've just been playing Stephen Burr, and now, now I'm going to be playing in the Hot Roast Derby on the Saturday. 20, yeah. 25,000 sell out now at Bell Park. And so that was daunting. Of course. Yeah, I, I can't lie, that was daunting. I, I wasn't excited, but daunting at the same time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm thinking, wow, 25,000. Yeah. So he's called you in beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what sort of preparation did you do, knowing the crowd differences was going to be there? Yeah. Um, and I say that because I remember one of the things I used to do back in the day was run a music concert at Oceans in Hackney. Yeah. And we used to get some pro performers, you know, rap artists, mm -hmm. um, you know, acoustic artists, and they, some of the stuff they would do behind the scenes before they would come on stage right. to get themselves mentally prepared to perform in front of an audience. So here's Alan Ball mm -hmm. telling you you're now going to be playing a first team game. You've mm -hmm. played against Stephen Brother a few days before in front of two, three hundred people. Yeah. And you're now going to have to do your your thing on the pitch yeah. in front of 25,000 people. Yeah. What did you have to do mentally to prepare yourself for that? I think mentally, it's very hard to prepare for that as someone that's never been in professional football playing that friend of that kind of crowd. So mentally, I, I, I remember staying in that, I was in the hotel. I remember just saying to myself, right, I'm going to get a good night's sleep, I'm going to eat well, uh, don't think about it too much. And when I got up in the morning, again, obviously, you know, the flies are starting to kick in, you know, you drive to the ground. And so, you know, because it's local, it's a local derby, so we didn't have a coach or anything. Okay. Um, so I drove to the ground. And in, in, in my head, all I, all I said to myself is that, you know, I just want to, you know, make myself, yeah. make, make myself just, give myself just at least have a performance. Mm -hmm. But um, it went quite well, you know, okay. to, be, to be fair, considering it was my first game, my debut. Yeah. Uh, it lasted 69 minutes. Uh, and then, as I said before, the fitness side of it, that was the biggest thing. Because after, you know, even after 20 minutes of breathing out my ass, you know, it was pace, pace, pace of, of the game. Yeah. So... Yeah, six times minutes on board took me out, said well done. Uh, but yeah, afterwards I felt like, okay, that's the first one out of the way. Yeah, yeah, um, of course. And I remember the big thing I remember was the crowd, because we obviously it's a Pot Race Derby, so we're the Stoke City fans are fanatical. Yeah. Um, and they and they were really supportive, backing me out if I did something good on the ball or whatever, okay. you know, cheering and clapping and all that stuff. Yeah. So that gives you a bit of confidence. Of course. Uh, so I thought, right, okay, so the crowd have been all right with all right with me. So, you know, on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, so, as far as debuts go, it was a fantastic day, but it, but it was, you know, acceptable for me. So, here you are, you're playing now, mm. contract, you're playing now. What, what's your objectives? Are you looking now to be a starter? I want to prove to these guys I can actually start games. You mentioned already you were in all of them. Mm. Did you actually believe you belonged in there? Yeah, I think, I think I'm not, not straight away. You know, not straight away. I think um, I was sold for quite a few times. And obviously, you got to remember that, you know, more and more I'm getting involved with the gambling. Because um, I was introduced to the casinos, you know, okay. very, very quickly after um, signing for Stoke. Because you have sort of, like, groups or clicks, whatever you want to call it, players that went to the casino and stuff. So, I got involved with that. So, I'd say that the first year was a little bit, you know, a bit of turmoil, I'd okay. say, you know, in and outside. Struggling a little bit, you know, not got to the addiction stage yet, but yeah. still, still struggling with it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think with, without that, if you took that away, it probably would have, you know, progressed quicker. Okay. Played more games. More games. Okay. Uh, but so I was sort of, my form was, was sporadic. I was in and out of the side. Okay. Um, but yeah, in terms of you know taking to the second division, you know, after after a few weeks, yeah, it was fine. I remember playing at uh, Filby Street, Leicester. Yeah. One memory I've got in the second division was when we played West Brom. And um, the, the guy that the guy, the guy that I'm going to mention, you 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 know, because I think he was managing Leicester, wasn't he? Yeah, not so long ago. Mm. Uh, so Craig Shakespeare. Okay. So he was playing for West Brom in midfield. Okay. And um, I went up for this ball, and yeah, <laughs> this is my experience of welcome to the you know, professional football. Yeah. He gave me elbow and smashed all my teeth up, and these two teeth here are have been screwed in since that. Day. I love that challenge. Yeah, since that day, went to hospital, emergency treatment. Um, and yeah, they've been screwed ever since. So yeah, that was my idea. Did you get sent off a car? No, 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 no. This was just welcome yeah. to the... Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so look at that. one of the videos I've seen online with you is quite a famous one, is where you scored 
an equalising goal in 1991, I think, at Anfield yeah. against Liverpool, mm. scoring past one of my heroes when I was growing up, Bruce Gobbler. Bruce, so I'm yeah. seeing you there on the pitch. So, so you've you haven't just made it. You've you're, you're playing against a top yeah. Premiership uh, a European side at that stage, Liverpool, right? yeah. and you're there going on the pitch and scoring. Um, scoring goals. Yeah, remember then when that draw came out because the league call, I remember telling my family you know, we're playing in the ball and everyone's fucking ecstatic, everyone wants a ticket. That's, that's the hardest thing, getting a yeah. ticket for everyone. Because uh, you get a certain amount of comps but you can't get any tickets. So yeah, a lot of the family came down. It was a Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. um, it was the main game on midweek sports special, so televised. And uh, you know, my, my feeling of, of that night is Really, this one talking about being in awe, it was really now I am really in awe of certain players. You of know, course. you've got players like Steve McManaman, you know, Ian Rush, Ian, Ian Saunders, exactly. Mark Walters. Exactly. You know, these are, so this was the yeah, yeah. creme de la creme. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I remember walking into uh, the dressing room and the thing that struck out was absolutely huge, huge, massive dressing room. Okay. And just the marble corridors and just everything about the stadium, um, lush pitch, etc. And I'm, um, yeah, I was still for the night. Mm -hmm. uh, I know my family came down hoping to get on, you know, may get on, may get off, of course, yeah, may not. And then we're losing 2 1. Uh, Ian Rush scored both Liverpool's goals. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, legend of Liverpool. Um, and I remember sitting on the bench and I think, I think it was uh, his second goal, it was a header. Yeah. Uh, and I just remember thinking, fucking hell, it was so easy to win. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, like, hopefully I'll get on. You know what I mean? We're losing 2 1. And there's an 88 minute. And uh, Lou Macari, you know, says warm up, had a little stroll and said, Why well, you come on? And uh, I think when I came on, I, after, within the first minute, we had a corner and I hooked one over the bar. Okay. That was my first touch. First touch yeah. yeah, and then within another two minutes, through ball from a left back Lee Fowler down the channel, Gary Ablett, me and him were sort of chasing. Yeah, yeah it's gone beyond the back four, me and him were chasing. Gary Ablett's no longer with us, God bless him. And he went through, and then it's just me and Grubbler. And I don't know what your question is going to be now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I, get, I, get, I get asked it so many times. <clears throat> yeah, even from today, I get asked it so many times. Yeah. So, I have to do this way. You, you've got to, yeah, I, I, I can't lie. So, I'm one on one with the keeper. I'm, Grubbler's come out, yeah, and I've gone to side foot it. Yeah. yeah. So, I've got good connection. You know, really good connection side foot it. But I think, that as your grubbler and the left corner's there, I think I've gone to side foot it into that corner. Corner. But it's gone. And it's like gone through his legs straight yeah. through. Hey, it's, it's gone like gold. It's me on me. Gold is gold. So, yeah, happy days. And, it, okay. and this is at Anfield. It's at Anfield. We've got 7,500 snow fans behind yeah. the goal. Exactly. So I scored at the right end. They went from pandemonium. Um, it was a mad, crazy night. I remember yeah. the two things that stand out about that night. One is... Um, after the game, Elton Wellesby, who was doing the ITV um, presentation okay. on the midweek sports session, uh, he said something like, oh, you know, Tony Kelly was brought back down to earth, you know, straight after the game. And that was because Lou Macari is a, he's legendary in the game for mm -hmm. fitness. Mm -hmm. So because I only played four minutes, yeah. as far as he's concerned, I haven't done enough, yeah, so yeah. you can run around the track. So I ran so fucking around the track. Yeah, yeah, for 10 minutes. <laughs> Even though I've just fucking been a hero and got the equaliser. Yeah. So yeah, he brought me back down to her straight away. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing was the, the night afterwards, because we must have got back to Stoke-on-Trent probably around midnight, something like that. And, and obviously my cousin and the family and all that, you know, and the particular yeah. club that we said we'd meet. And I just remember going, walking into that nightclub, Maxim's nightclub in Stoke-on-Trent. It was just unbelievable, mate. Everybody you know, was singing, singing, singing chanting. It was just memories that mm -hmm. like, yeah, you, you just live with you forever, mate. So Tony, mm -hmm. this is, this is a point in the interview where I'm, I might get a bit emotional, mm. I don't know about yourself, because your journey has been that of a 16 year old boy mm. whose older brother got him his first trial, he's gone in, he's experienced that, come out, dealt with that, gone into non-league, dealt with that, gone to Sweden, dealt with that, yeah. come back, earned yourself a contract, living the life, you've scored a goal at Anfield. Mm. You're, you're at the top of your game. At the top of your game, this yeah, is what every yeah. boy's dream is doing. Behind the scenes, and you've already mentioned it once or twice, but behind the scenes, there's something eating and grinding away at you that eventually is going to rob you of your career. Yeah. Mm. Talk to us about that. 
I think I mentioned earlier about the casinos. I think the st going to the casinos was the start of a, of a slippery slope. When we talk about gambling addiction, for some, particularly now when we're talking about you know um, online gambling, but as a fact then there was no online gambling, so it was the bookers or the casino. Uh, so it could escalate. You know now it can escalate rapid, quickly now, but back then you know it's a gradual thing. Uh, but once I started to get involved in the casinos with, with the probably four or five players. Um, obviously, bookies straight after training. So yeah. I finished training maybe one o'clock. Um, straight down the bookies, day off. Straight down the bookies, then casinos. So, so, so let me take you right, right back. What was your very first bet, and why did you even bet? Like, what, what took you down the road of having to gamble? What, what happened? So, what was yeah, the so the bet? first bet goes right back to Dolly Chamlet. Yeah, so there was um, a bookmakers across the road from Dolly Chamlet called Mecca Bookmakers. Mm -hmm. Don't forget it green and red logo and um, if you, when you mentioned about different ways, different reasons why people gamble, so there's lots of different reasons, of course, yeah. we talk all night, childhood trauma, lots of, you know, whether you're going through mental health issues, um, family history, lots of different reasons, yeah. like advertising promotion now these days. Uh, but then for me, um, and this, this is not just in gamble, this is in lots of different things in terms of peer pressure. Of course. So, you know, when you're at school, you, you know, it's like some kids that want to try and fit in in a certain group, they might be smoking weed or cigarette, just to fit in. And that's how I sort of felt, because I'd come from Coventry, and to me, London back then was London. You know, if you, if you talk to people in Coventry back then, and you said, oh, I'm going to London, we go, oh, fucking hell, yeah, really? It's a big life. It's a big life, yeah, this of course. Proper, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, how, that's how London was perceived back then. Of course. Um, so I'm in London, I come from Coventry, mm -hmm. listen to all the, what I call Cockney accents and the dressing room and all that stuff. And, yeah. You know, so I wasn't a really, really confident person at that time. You know what I mean? So I, I wanted to find a way how how it could be long, how it could fit in. And this group of five or six players that had these football accumulators next door on a Saturday before the match, um, and they said, "Oh, you know, turn, you know, this is what we do." That was there. So that's that was my introduction into five power football accumulators. I remember, it was five ways we used to do. Uh, that was the first time I got involved in football football gambling. Okay. Just just by wanting to fit into it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you've had your first bet. Did you win your first bet? Was no. it a winning bet? No. Wasn't a winning bet. No. So obviously you've you still want to fit in, so you're going back on a weekly yeah, basis. Yeah, telling me about that wins and all that stuff. Yeah, winning. Um, at what stage do you believe you sort of thought this is not just a ha habit now, like mm -hmm. something I'm just doing to pass on time or do with my mates? At what stage did you think this is? impacting me a little bit but at what stage in your career or whilst you're trying to push on with your football did you think this 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 money issue is becoming becoming an issue i'd say in, in the height of the addiction was at stoke i'd probably say that the, maybe the second year once i've you know really got into the uh, casino or in the book is every day but i never i never actually thought about oh you know dean oh, this this is this is really impacting me i never you know because so you never saw it internally no no you no. didn't think it was affecting no. your performances at training your performances no in the game. i didn't think of it in that way okay and i think because it's it consumes you you know so everything you'll think about is gambling mm -hmm. um first thing that you know, in the morning you want the body you want to you want to have, you want to have a bet you know, going on the football pitch as i said before about how it you know affects my mind and my mental state of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes, you know, managers couldn't work me out. You know, they, they, I'll be, I'll be man of the match one week, and I'll be out the team for a month, they just could not work me out. Um, and that's because my former social product was struggling. But you were hiding this at this yeah, stage. Yeah, you yeah, wasn't yeah, telling them, someone knows. Yeah. So I borrow money left, right, centre, but I wouldn't tell reasons why. I borrow money off um, the club. I remember going into Petty, going into the office and asking for Petty Cash and Louis Curry, but, you know, I didn't ask why. Um, so I borrow money everywhere I can, loans, every, every, you name it, I, I you know, um, got money from all, from all yeah. sources. Um, but I never sort of admitted to myself or acknowledged that, oh, oh God, this is, this is proper gambling addiction. Mm. Because gambling addiction wasn't talked about. Yeah. It wasn't talked about, it wasn't seen as, as, a, as, a, as a mental health issue, as a gambling disorder. Yeah. It wasn't talked about in those, in those terms then. Um, it was really normal. So an example would be away matches. Uh, traveling, you know, four or five hours away on the coach, and and every football club had one. Had, every football club had a, had a card school, what we call five or six players, pack of the coach, and then you pay three card break, and, and serious money is being spent. 
Okay, and that's on the way to your away trips. Yeah, yeah, and that's how normal it was because you know, I remember loads of times where Paul young ball because he, he actually went into horse racing and bought horse racing as a trainer and all that. So, you know, there's, there was a sort of connection with, with gambling and, and football. So they would come down to the back of the coast. Alan Ball, director, chairman, come down, join in. Yeah. That's how normal it was. It was, yeah. Yeah, so no one really talked about gambling addiction or that this is an issue or that's a gambling disorder, it's a mental health issue. Yeah. No one really talked about that. And that's why I didn't think about it. So, so where did it impact? Where did it cross over? Because at this stage, you say you're hiding it. Because mm-hmm. loads of people bet. Yeah. Without it being a problem to them, yes. and then you have problem gamblers who yeah. don't know when to stop or can't mm. draw the line. Mm. So, at what stage was their crossover where it actually impacted your career? I'd say that when I when I came to the finishing the contract for two and a half years, that's when I saw I thought, well, this is this is not right because I'm going, you know, down the division. I'm going to. Um, I think the first club that came into was Bury. Yeah, very football club. So, so if I just rewind there, mm. so you say the club that came into you. So, what, once your two and a half year contract elapsed, mm. were Stoke not offering you a new contract? No. Was there not talks about no. that? No, uh, Lou Macari um, called me and said that you know there's not going to be future plans. This is about three months before the end of the contract. Uh, so he said we'll put you on the transfer list. Okay. And then it's a matter of you know whoever comes in. And I think that the crazy thing about it, I think when he said I was on the transfer list and, and whoever comes in. All, all my mind was thinking, I don't care who comes in, as, yeah. long, as long as I go to another club and get a sign on something. Because all I was thinking about was just gambling in my debts. Because by now, my debts were just accumulating. Of course. So all I'm thinking about, right, and get a good sign on for you and clear some of that. Yeah, and then, and then carry on. Carry, you know, not, not clear some of my debts and address my situation, clear yeah. some of my debts and then I'll end up with five pounds and continue. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the mindset. That's yeah, the mindset. Of course. Course. When it starts to be an addiction, that's the mindset. Okay. So that's that's how that's so how very important. very show interest. Yeah, they um they agree a fee with a uh, Stoke. And they go down to Bury again. It was fifteen grand. Uh, okay. This was Bury because I'm sort of I suppose you could say. Um, a name. I'm, yeah, a I sort of name going to Bury from Stoke. That, oh, type, that type of thing. So I could sort of you know command a decent wage. Yeah. Sign on fee. Um, yeah, and then the same old cycle really. Continued, done well at Berry, scored a lot of goals at Berry, um, but continued the gambling. Yeah, the, the gambling is, is the one thing. Whether it was at Stoke, Berry, I, I couldn't, I couldn't shift it. I couldn't deal with it. There's been other players that have had addictions, yeah. be it alcohol or whatever they were doing, mm-hmm. and there's talk of when they were on the pitch, that was the moment where they felt free. Yeah, they felt, you know, exactly. themselves. They could yeah. really be themselves on the pitch, and then it's when they came off the pitch. That all the other stuff yeah. that was that's, was that's really thing? interesting now is because I, I, I said that to people before about how we all cope with things differently you know we all you know resilient in our own way mm-hmm. and for some whether it's a footballer whether it's a snooker player whatever it is a sports professional yeah you know for them you know I think, I think of someone like Paul Merson who, who went through obviously horrendous gambling addiction but on the field he was fine he was still fine and I think that's their escapism that's so their escapism. Their, their escapism is one on that football pitch on a snooker table or wherever yeah. it is. You know, that's where they feel, you know, most comfortable. It's when they come off and they start with gambling and the family dynamics and all the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, with me, I, I, I struggled with both. You know, but I, I, um, if I lost a, a lot of money the day before, which is obviously often the case on a yeah. Friday, you know, I wouldn't sleep at night. You know, you're talking getting getting four or five o'clock in the morning, getting up, going to the ten o'clock for the game. Yeah. So I haven't slept. I'm not focusing. Yeah. You know, and I get to the ground all that. But in my head, I'm thinking, I am literally thinking. You know, I oh, am my football accumulator. The accumulator is going to come in today. You know, because I've got some bets on. I'm hoping that. Yeah. And that's what's going through my even before. Well, right at the ten years before, back kick off. Kick off. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. So the one person that's in my mind now and he's just churning away in my mind mm. is the missus. Yeah. Mm. So. What people need to realise is you're suffering the addiction and you're going through it, but this is impacting all your relationships outside. Yeah. We've already talked about emotions up and down, not sleeping. Yeah. What's the impact on 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 the So this is Sandra, she's been on the journey from more or less day one, from Chesson Days. Um, and so the impact on her really was so for instance I, I was I was I bought a house in Stoke. Um, I was living there on my own. She had a really good job in London, so she'd come up uh, to weekends mm-hmm. um, and sometimes during the week on a day off. And then I'd be vice versa. I'd go down to London for a weekend and on a Wednesday, I'd day off. Yeah. Go to London. 
But there, there was lots of times where, one, I didn't feel like it because I, I feel like shit. Mm -hmm. I'm in a depressive state. Um, I just didn't feel like seeing anybody. Of course. You know, and, I, and I'd make for excuses. Uh, like, for instance, I'd say, oh, you know, the gaffer's called to call to say next extra training. I can't do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then there's a trust about money because I used to support it financially. Um, so slowly, as, as time went on, yeah. So at the start, yeah, okay, when I've got the sign on for it, so all that stuff I might, you know, support. But then as time goes on, it, she would say, mm -hmm. yeah, but you want X amount of money, why can't, why why can't we do this? Yeah, why can't and I'd make up excuses. Uh, lies, so we talk about lies and deceit. So the impact, you know, we call them today in our, in our industry affected others. So the impact on her was, was massive. And yeah. So we slow, the, the trust slowly went, you know, yeah. over a period of time, continued hurting her down, you know, particularly later when our daughter was born, you know, that I think that had a massive impact because obviously we continue that in uh, whether it's birthday, Christmas, presents, all that kind of stuff, you know, gambling money away. Um, but I never really went deep into you know what I'm going through with her. She just knew that you know, yeah, you can, you want to be careful, you can, but we didn't talk about it. The detail, and I didn't, and I didn't you know, okay. give her the full truth of what's happening. Okay. So at what stage? I mean, you see different shows and stuff mm -hmm. where it comes on, and there's there's a point where they say I've hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Someone calls gamblers anonymous, or yeah. something happens. What was rock bottom for you? When 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 did it was you know what mm -hmm. I need to address this, or yeah. I could lose absolutely everything? Yeah, I think. Well, by the time I finished my football career, um, the house was just about to be repossessed. I'd had a couple of cars repossessed already. Um, but I hadn't, I hadn't kicked the habit, so I'd come back to London 31 or something like that. Signed to say it was again. Um, then I went to Network Rail. So when I went to Network Rail, um, the gambling, as I said, th this is continuous gambling now. I'm yeah. not going to add it. Gonna, this, yeah. is, this is continuous gambling. It's not stopping. I haven't addressed it or anything. Your football career is history. That's but no right. point throughout the whole football career to be no. saying, I've got to stop, I've no. got to address, I've got to speak to someone. No. So no. it's just been going on. Oh, so no. we're talking about, you said it started at Dunwich Dunlit, Hamlet. Yeah. So we're possibly talking about over 20, 20, 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So what happened is I went to Dunwich Hamlet, well, sorry, I went to Network Rail. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working there for 10 years as a superman. Um, obviously gambling, gambling, continuing and racking up lots of debts. So by now the debts are just piling up, piling up, different creditors. Because um, you're not earning the same for you yeah, exactly. where as a footballer. Exactly, yeah, it's lots of different creditors, trying to pay off debts, you know, paying plans, all the rest of it. Um, so what happened then is there was a change, I would say the start of my sort of recovery journey, I'd say, 2010. Um, I um, decided to go bankrupt. So I had a £192,000 bankruptcy file. Um, my sister, family, give me the idea that, you know, this is something, a way out of getting out of debt. Because if I, if I had the house, or if I had a 20 grand car or whatever, that, that would have to go against my debts, yeah. you know. So I didn't have the house and I didn't have a 20 grand car. So for me, it, it fitted me. Um, so knowing in my head that I could actually clear this £192,000 debt. Yeah. The thing was about £700 it cost to go bankrupt. I remember doing the form, going down the courthouse, high court. Yeah. Um, and coming out of the high court, I was with my brother. Okay. And I remember I was really, really happy. Massive weight off my, off my mind when I come out of that high court, knowing that this £192,000 debt was cleared. It's cleared. And knowing that I don't have to worry about, you know, bailiffs knocking on the door, fucking phone calls, letters, all the rest of it. Yeah. So that was, I would say, the sort of start. Because at the same time, within that year, 2010, 2011, as I said, work my network around. Uh, this is where I believe the start of my recovery, really on a real personal level, yeah. starts to where I am today. Um, and, it's, and it is individual, it is personal, it's, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but Network Rail, I was working one Sunday and I had a knock on the door. And um, yeah, we don't have visitors, you work alone in the signal box yeah. um, in a remote part of Dollis Hill. And uh, there was this uh, old chap, white guy, 50, 60, whatever. Didn't recognise him. Um, as I said, don't have visitors. We only have regional manager. Yeah. And uh, he said he's a local network rail chaplain. So I goes, well, I've been here 10 years. I've never had a visit from him. He said, your signal box has come up as a, as a visit. So I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. So came in, showed me his ID, sat down, had a Bible with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, remember, I remember he said, let's, let's just do this prayer first. And which I now know is a salvation prayer. So he wrote, he had it written out. And uh, we said it together and we talk. And at this point, we're going through the bankruptcy, just about sort of coming to the end of the relationship with the missus. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so life's a bit of a mess. And it was a case of, it wasn't a case of that after this two hour uh, session with um, the ch chap in that all things are going to change and all that. No, it wasn't like, like that at all. It was, a, it was like a warning sign. It was like, you know, we talked about home, we talked about the future. Um, when I got back home, I started to read different scriptures in the Bible. Okay. Um, so I started to, I would say, started to start regaining my faith. Okay. Talked to my family about it and everything. Um, and my mom's very religious. Um, and they said, well, you know, you need to start a person to gamble. You know what I mean? So within two years, 2013, but just before 2013, 12, 13, my sister had this idea about, you know, putting my story to print because there were some players that came out in the press. Um, Michael Chopper was one of them, I remember, yeah, yeah. Um, about their gambling issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't know where to start as well. I thought, that's, that's fact, yeah? Mm -hmm. just, it's simple as that, I wouldn't know where to start. So she said, look, just write a few chapters. You know, even up to one chapter. So she was a she was a head teacher. Okay. She said, "I'll send it to me, and I'll, I'll give me a view." Mm -hmm. So I've done this. A four paper, fire wrote, just wrote away. Yeah, you know, a couple of weeks, and then uh, sent it to her. And she said, "This is amazing. So this this is what you want. This is your journey. Starting from commentary, nine years old, mm -hmm. going through the football, the racing, the addiction, the whole lot." Yeah. And so then, then it'll raise awareness. So okay. So from that moment, I couldn't stop writing. Okay. And it took me 18 months uh, with a biro and a four paper. Yeah, and then this, you know, go slide to my bill, call it all that stuff. That's yeah. why don't get me started on people to bring out books. But uh, because this is my story on paper, yeah. written by me. And, yeah. and I think therapeutic wise, it really helped me. And I think that was the start in terms of me actually deciding. And I, and I can't even pinpoint how, what made me decide that I'm going to go public. Because one of the biggest things of a problem gambler yeah. is that shame and guilt. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go public with this. Uh, and I, I still can't think why I believe that I did. Um, so but, just, just sorry to cut in there, but yeah. just something's banging in my, in my mind. You've, you've lost the house. Mm. You've lost cars. Mm. Your relationship potentially you've lost Eventually went. was going. Mm. And none of those things had got you to stop gambling. But this chaplain, mm. who you've never met in your life, no. has come, sat down with you, mm. we've gone through a little prayer, you're, you're seeing that as the fault, as that point where, mm. you know what, I need to do something about this. Yeah. But I didn't, I, I didn't with, with the chaplain business and the regain with faith, I didn't uh, sort of put the two together. I didn't go home and think, oh, right, okay, if I, if I really regain the faith, if I like, read all the scriptures, if I really worship and that yeah. things in the chain. I didn't think of it like, like that. It, yeah. it, it just happened. Naturally. It just naturally mm -hmm. happened. And that's why my faith is so strong because it's happening for a reason. It's just that I'm not realising. But I will realise what it, why it's happening for. And I think the fact that I could write a book, which I told you I could never thought in a million years I could. Yeah. Yeah. That that was the it's thing so. that told me of course. They said, you know what, there's something going on here. You know, I know I know as I said to you before. It's a very, very personal, individual thing. Everyone has their own religions and faith, and you respect them all. Yeah. Whatever makes you feel comfortable. Yeah. Whatever makes you, you know, uh, feel about hope for the future. And this, this, this is what I was feeling. I was feeling, oh, this is unbelievable. Yeah. And the book was when we sent it to six publishers, and we got, you know, feedback and saying, yeah, we'll take the book on. And then, you know, the momentum's growing. The book is going to be published, literally. And I was telling the family, and they said, right, you need to do more now. And my sister and my mom, as I said, are very religious. And they were the ones that were telling me, this is your calling card, you know, this is, this is meant to happen, you've now got to continue this, of course. You know, so they, they helped me believe that this is, this is something different. And also, the fact that I started to worship in St. George's down Enfield, that became my local church. Okay. So my conversations with Father Taman was again reinforcing why this is happening. Yeah. You know, he's putting building blocks in for place for you. He's giving you the tools. It's what's what you do with those you tools. Know, you know what I mean? And that's and, and that's how I was feeling. That's that's my, my whole body and mind was feeling that wow, this is this is a new, this is a new journey for me. Where you go, you mean? Yeah. So it's, it's very it's difficult to explain. Of course, yeah, but it's uh, it's it's a very personal thing, yeah. And it, and it's helped save you in many ways. Yeah. In many ways. Yeah. So we fast track a little bit to today. Yeah. And I know you're you're head of an organisation called Red Card. Yeah. Um, Please tell our viewers a little bit about that. So after the book came out, 2014, I um, the feedback that I had from that was 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 unbelievable. So we did the BBC Breakfast and the Talk Sport and all the rest of it. And then I thought, right, okay. People said to me, you need to set something up. Now again, 
this is this is what I mean of going back to the faith because I don't come from a business background. I don't know about governance and policies and all the rest of it. But somehow, you know, I've managed to somehow I've managed to, you know, get directors on board and somehow I've managed to get a team together. So we got incorporated in 2015, Red Car Family Sport Project. We decided we want to go down the education awareness prevention uh, route because we, we believe that you know early intervention is key to the young people and the way gambling addiction is growing in this country yeah um we thought right you know we can't rely on the government for change so we're gonna have to try and do some change yeah, ourselves itself, yeah. yeah so i've got a really good team together and we deliver as you know educational workshops and i do my personal talks etc and we just continue continue to raise awareness but you know to your point to your question about how i set it up you know, that was difficult, yeah. Uh, but I think the people and the network around me, the support is what is what helps. I like you know business people that have sort of advice about, you know, getting directors on board and getting yeah. the board together and yeah. all these little things that you need to work with an organization, um, getting our sort of policies in place, say crime policies, all the different things. But you learn you learn as you go along. But well, for me, the strange thing is I didn't find it difficult. You know, I found it and again this is Going back to my faith, this is what being put in place for me. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the, the transaction was quite smooth to where I am today in terms okay. of running the organisation. So you're going around to different clubs, schools. Who, who's your target audience? Target audience is young people. So that, yeah, that's why we do a lot of schools. Um, we're just in the middle of a funding project with like three, four, all the London secondary schools. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's our main target audience. We have delivered to rehab centres and rotary clubs and other organisations. Uh, and we'll continue to do that because it gambling addiction affects everybody of age, gender, whatever, background, status, irrelevant. So yeah, we'll continue to do that, but yeah. mainly I want to um, educate, you know, young people. And it's part of your, your own recovery, mm -hmm. because as you say, once an addict, always an addict. So, yeah. Um, I know this is probably a personal question, but when was your, when was your last bet? How, how clean are you? My last bet was two days ago. And I, 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 I want to see the expression on your face because I want to see. I want to see if you're shocked or not. Well, so would you I, tell you tell me if you're shocked? I know, sir. So. Addiction is that. It's yeah. just that. Yeah. So no matter how how um, how long someone is in the recovery process, yeah. it only takes one moment yeah. to relapse. And you know, so yeah. I'm I'm shocked, but not shocked. If yeah. you know what I mean, because I know it's a problem that will okay. always be in the back of someone's yeah. mind. So I'll mind. explain a little bit about where I am today yeah, mm -hmm. in terms of addiction. So we always say that, you know, we're recovering gambling addicts, you yeah. know, because as you said, you know, a relapse can happen any time. Mm -hmm. And any little situation in your life that changes, losing a loved one, for instance, or anything can trigger it. Trigger, yes. Yeah. So the way I can explain that I beat my demons, yeah, was 2016 was when, so 15, the project was set on. Because we are a CIT company, a community interest company, we rely on funding and donations, yeah? So we have to get funding to run the projects, get materials, all the rest of it, and uh, from the National Lottery. Uh, so you fill in these proposal forms, you have to tick all the boxes and all that stuff. We got turned down a couple of times because I'm, I'm still learning how to make sure we do proper funding bits. And then the first time, 2017, when we got the first £10,000. So as the CEO of Red Card, we have our business bank account, I have the debit card, so you can imagine that ten thousand pounds is now dropped into my account, of course. So that is when I that is like I call the acid test. Because that I'm starting the organization just started to go now and think right, don't mess this up, you know, this this organization go far. If you do things right, you know, cut back in your gambling, whatever. Yeah. And that's and that ten thousand pounds was for all organization materials, paying facilitator fees for people to deliver projects, yeah, paying travel expenses and all that. Um, so from 2017 to today, yeah, we've probably got over, I don't received over, I have, well I have received, when I say I, I mean the company, but it's gone into the business bank account, which I have a debit card for, yeah. probably about 170,000, I'd say, that I could just go to the casino for one bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's passed through my hands. Um, I've built trust with lots of you right there. Though. Yeah. Stop you right there. Mm -hmm. um, why would you put yourself in a situation to, to test yourself like that? Yeah. You're, you're running an organization, yeah. large sums of money are coming through. Mm. You know yourself you have a, this problem with gambling. Why would you not leave the finances in the hands of somebody else to look after? Why would you actually yeah. put yourself in such a vulnerable state? It's funny, that's a good question, but I, I think that I felt confident 
I felt confident that I'd beat this. I felt confident. I remember all my, all, for the last four years, every single bill was paid on time. I don't, yeah. have, I don't have no debt. Yeah. Yeah, I'm debt free. Every bill is paid on time. And the 170 grand that has gone through my hands has been looked after. I've run the company with all the accounts absolutely perfectly. Yeah. And that's what I mean when I say I've beat my demons because now I'm in control. So when you're, when with gamma addiction, it takes control. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have no control. You see, on a daily basis, 24 seven, it's taking control. It's gripped you, it's consumed you. Now I'm on the opposite side of the fence. So you talked about people that are gambling today. And this is what I say about red card. We don't, we don't wave, wave the red flag and tell people to stop gambling. No, people have a right to gamble if they want. And as you said, there's millions of people that have a bet without it ever being a problem without it. Ever encountering gambling harm. And we have to remember that because it is a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. It's fun for some people, you know, going to the, I don't know, see that night out or whatever, going to the races. So there's nothing wrong with that. So that's where I'm, I'm one of them now. And that, and that is, I can't tell you how good it feels. I could go for a month without having a bet. Yeah. yeah. And that happens quite a lot. Uh, and then I might say, okay, um, football weekend, it might be, I don't know, anything. Could yeah. Fine with that. I'll yeah. Say, I'll pop a tenner on. But I don't have to, and I don't depend on it. And it doesn't matter if I win or lose, because financially I'm stable. So none of, all the things that you depend on as a gambling addict is on the complete opposite. Mm. And, and for me, to get to where I am, in feeling like that, it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling. It's an amazing feeling. And I think that time, with, with all the money going through, it wasn't a conscious decision to put myself in that position. Yeah. I think the red card uh, organisation, I'm the one that's found in it. I'm the one that's got to build it. And, and with that comes the finances. Yeah. It has to go for a business bank account. Yeah. Yes, I could, you could. You I get have, that. You could yes, still put I could have gone to my debt. I could have gone to my director yeah. and said, you know what, Paul, you know, I don't feel comfortable with this. But I didn't feel like that. Mm. I felt 100% I'll beat you guys. And, and I, I was proved right. Mm. So I understand in the last week or so, mm. there's been another book um, mm. launched. Um, Tell us what this book is about and how it differs yeah. from the first one, potentially. So the first one was mainly about raising awareness, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and about um, letting my family and friends, you know, extended family as well, know what I've been through. Um, because, as I said before, the denial factor has stayed there for years and years. Yeah. So I turn up at fun family functions um, and people say, oh, you know, how can you not drive this and drive that and blah, 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 go for the story without going through in detail. Yeah. So I thought, you know, one, raise awareness, and then two, is, yeah, to let people actually know what I've gone through. And that story takes me to 2014. Okay. So Red Car Gambling Support Project wasn't born. So okay. it, and it, it wasn't really, you know, something that I was mainly thinking about. I didn't know what the future holds. I had yeah. no idea what the future holds. Okay. Um, so after that book was published and then the feedback I got, uh, over a period of time, Red Card was born, people were saying, you know, but people want to wonder what happened next. You know, what happened in the last seven years to today? Yeah. And I, I didn't really think about it until people started telling me, saying, yeah, you should bring another book out and let, let people know where the journey is yeah. from the, the end from of the edition. The end of the 2014. Yeah, to the 40th to, to today. I thought, good idea. So, yeah, so um, this time round, whether it's an um, experience of writing the first book, yeah. you know, uh, whether it's there's so much to cram in in the last seven years, you know, in terms of the organisation, in terms of places I've been, yeah, the House of Parliament, yeah, and things, um, it was quite, you know, really, really, I'd say really, really enjoyable. The, the, writing this book, um, I would say, was really more enjoyable than the first one. The first one, obviously, I, I'm, I'm reliving what I've been through, you know, through. And yeah. going public and thinking. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking. Okay, now should I be doing this? So, it, 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 although, I, you know, I've done it and I've done well, you know, from, from what people say anyway, um, but in terms of enjoyment and really, really getting into the meaty side of yeah. this, this sport, because the last, the last seven years, it takes in what's happened what's in the last seven years, and a lot has happened in the last seven years. So, so two things, you've got a copy of yes, it yes. for the camera so they can, we can see it there, and, and, and a brief note on how someone could purchase that if they're interested. So this is a red card, and I brought thought of the title myself. I bet you can win, uh, and as I keep saying to you, I'll beat my demons. Yeah. So yes, it is a bet you can win, and that. And what I, what I mean by that is, it gives people hope. So it will tell you, it will explain to people in terms of when they read my story that you can come out of adversity, you can come out of trauma, yeah. trauma, 
you can still be successful in whatever you want to do. So it is a bet you can win. Yeah. Uh, it's available on all, all the outlets. It was actually published on April the 30th. Yeah. Uh, so it's that, you know, Amazon's and Waterstones and all the rest of them. And, yeah. Um, and also, obviously, go to the website, Red Card Gambling Sport Project website, with details about it there. Okay. So, yeah, so for now, um, we're going to push the book out in the next probably three months, do a lot of campaign on it. I've got lots of bits of media stuff to do. Of course. Um, but, yeah, very, very enjoyable um, writing this book. Cool. So, I've got two questions. Yes. We'd just like to wrap up one. Um, the first one is obviously when you first went public. Mm. With your first book, when you say you're, you're now going out there and exposing yourself after all these yeah. years of, of hiding this, did, did any of your ex managers, ex pros, call you and contact you afterwards and think, you know, ah, oh, that explains it? I, it you know, did, yeah. did you get those phone calls coming back? I didn't get phone calls, but because of the world we live in, I've got lots of social media messages. You know, ex players, a uh, couple of ex coaches. And I think the, the thing that stood out. Yeah, we talk about the denial factor is that you know, I had ex players that I played with at very slow who then come out to me personally saying that oh you know I should win the yeah but they, 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 didn't, they couldn't talk about it yeah. you know what I mean so they're saying it's great that you'll talk about it and but I think managers did managers managers no, not no, managers no one no. came back to you and said that bloody explains it Tony that's that's why we could I couldn't put my finger on it no, no, but, no one. but there's one thing that where there could have been involvement there could have been involvement there could have been support um, in terms of collaboration with my, you know, affiliation with Stoke City. So Stoke City are owned by the Coast family, yeah? Okay. And they own Bet365, yeah? They're, they're multi-millionaires. Mm -hmm. So on this journey about three years ago, um, people said, oh, you need, to, you need to do a lot more work within, within the football world. Mm -hmm. You know, you're an ex-footballer, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I had, I had meetings with the FA, PFA. Yeah. They like to put it under the carpet. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then uh, someone, someone contacted me in social media saying that, oh, you know, we could put a little um, like a mini documentary together and you can narrate around the pitch. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we we'll do that. So we contacted Stoke. Now, when I signed for Stoke in 1990, Peter Coates was the chairman. Okay. Today, 2021, Peter Coates is the chairman. Still the chairman. So he knows everything about me. He knows my background. He signed me. Everything about me. Yeah. Now, Peter Coates, you and your family are multi-billionaires and you're running an organisation that is for profit and is harming people. Mm -hmm. So why don't you use your social responsibility? You've got someone that you actually know, no, that you well. could use as yep. part of Bet365 on the social side, mm -hmm. responsible gambling side. Responsible gambling, yeah. They didn't no contact. Know. Didn't want to know. Not interested. And that's, that's, that's the sad thing about this um, gambling profit-driven business. Mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to actually, you know, Doing more in terms of social responsibility, these gambling companies, they're all for profit. Yeah. Simple as that, mate. <laughs> and, the, and the last question to finish I mean, life's for living. Mm. And, and I'm glad you're still here and alive with yeah. us because, as I say, the pressure you've been under and the different stuff that's gone around you, it could have ended in a very different, different yeah. way. But one thing that's in the back of my mind that I'd like to ask at this stage, and obviously, it's entirely up to you how you answer it, but what's one of your biggest or regrets when you look back at everything? Yeah. What would you say is the biggest regret that you, know, you might not be able to fix it now because it's gone? Yeah, yeah. But but yeah. What, what would you say is your biggest regret in your career? Yeah, everything. I life, think people life. that like people like myself, you know, and other other sports men and women, you know, more high profile than me, that have been through you know trauma and adversity, yeah, and the lost or whatever. I think sometimes you hear people say that, oh, you know, no, don't have any regrets. But I think deep down, most people, I would say, it's my opinion, you know, the majority of people, you know, you will have a regret of some sort. Mm -hmm. I mean, and my, my regret, I'd, say, I'd probably say I've got two. One is that um, I finished football at 30. So if I had to have, you know, that would be the, the, the highest regret, the fact that I lost five, six, seven years of the game. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so finishing freshman football at 30 is, is something that I think back on. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one would be probably losing that, losing the house. Because I think, you know, losing that, losing that house in, in, in Stoke on Trent, you mm -hmm. know, um, I don't know what we fucking work today, but, um, and then I have to rent a house because I'm building to buy a house again. Yeah, that will take time, I'm not yeah. worried about that. Okay. But you, you still think back and think, oh, you know, I didn't have a house with me. What's lovely? Yeah. I, I love my house in Stoke. Yeah. But, you know, Things happen. It's all part of the journey, and I think that um, mm -hmm. 
you know, ment mentally, you know, you mentioned earlier, I, I work, well, we work Red Carbon organisation, not work with them, but, you know, in collaboration with them, Gambling With Lives, charity. And uh, they're, they're parents that have lost sons and daughters to gambling. Of course. And when you talked about what I've been through, I sometimes, you know, say to myself, how didn't I go over the edge, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to the point of no return. And, that, and to me, that's, that's, to me, that's as far as I'm concerned. That's because um, God says, no, it's not your it's time. It's not your time yet. It's simple as that. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it is sad that some people get to that point. Of course. Uh, so, yeah, losing the house and, and a short, a a short term career, career from what it could be. Yeah. Well, but it's onwards and upwards. It is indeed. And as I say, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here today. I mean, the journey, the story um, is very intriguing, entertaining at times and emotional at that time because there's a lot involved yeah but thanks for coming on and sharing your story so tony kelly today's been your truth thank you very much thank you very much man i appreciate it